Hello everybody, I'm Melissa Ratliff and I'm Zooming from Gadigal and Wangal country to host presentations today by Archie Barry and I'm Rita Heppy, followed by a conversation as part of the Form by Content Talk series, which is presented by Monash Art, Design and Architecture and programmed by Monash University Museum of Art, MAMA, where I work as curator research. Monash in Melbourne is situated on the lands of the Bunurong, Bunurong and Wurundjeri peoples of the Kulin Nation. And we acknowledge First Nations connection to material and creative practice on these lands for more than 60,000 years. But this semester, the form by content theme is on connection. And Rita and Archie, who come from the worlds of contemporary dance and visual arts respectively, will be speaking about their different practices and sharing some images and videos. And then we'll let our thoughts go for a walk together for around 15 to 20 minutes. For access reasons, I'll give a brief visual description of myself. And after I hand over to Archie and then Amrita, they'll do the same. I'm a white cis woman in my early 40s with dark brown hair, which is shot through with a bit of gray. You probably can't quite make that out on the screen. I'm wearing a black and white abstract pattern T-shirt and behind me is not much, just a white wall and the edge of my brown couch. Um, Archie, would you like to introduce yourself, maybe say where you are and take the Zoom stage? Yeah, thank you. My name's Archie. Um, I'm a white person. I'm a trans person. I'm um, Zooming from Woiwurrung, Wurundjeri and Bunurong land. Um, I acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded. Um, I've got curly hair um, on the back of my head and no hair on the shaved front of my head. And I'm wearing a kind of crinkly purple t-shirt today. And my Zoom background at the moment is um, a still image of a 3D model of a cross section of my tongue, um, which has been taken from um, a, the most recent artwork that I've made, which I'll show an excerpt of in a minute. Um, and I'll just share my screen. So I, I don't have too many words, but I did want to share some words um, in this presentation, just as an acknowledgement of who some of the other thinkers and artists are who have inspired me and influenced the way that I work and to sort of connect with a sense of like a lineage of thinkers. Um, and I'm gonna jump in to one of the prompts that um, Mel, you sent Amrita and I in an email, which was around um, how our individual practices like present provocation to this idea of like the, a fixed self or a fixed identity and individualism as like a mainstream cultural form. Um, so I put this quote here from uh, Johanna Hedva, who's a Korean American artist, musician, writer, um, and I'll just read it out. They say, I cannot think of a form of embodiment that is not somehow disordered. The enforcing of self-possession has happened probably because of the self's radical disorder. Um, and I just think that's like a lovely opener to speak to my work. Um, like I don't sort of experience being a person or personhood as like a linear or a static experience. And I suspect that probably most of us don't. Um, live and feel in those ways. So um, when I'm working, I'm often thinking about um, like this history of Western rationalism, the fields of science and 
um, like diagnostics tools, which I consider to be part of my cultural inheritance and which I consider to be like worth looking into and thinking about. Um, I've got another quote here from the Vietnamese um, filmmaker and scholar Trinh Thi Minh Ha. Um, an image is powerful, not necessarily because of anything specific it offers to the viewer, but because of everything it apparently also takes away from the viewer. Um, I'll just let this image sit here while I speak. Um, so um, across my practice, what I'm interested in doing as I keep on working is I'm realizing like I'm creating like a kind of genealogy of these personas, which um, are maybe subhuman or like superhuman uh, or non-human or like these hybrid forms, which are fundamentally like aspects of my own identity. So I have like a self-portraiture practice, but um, like the interest is always in like presenting a self which is um, um, like that maybe undermines like the sort of like classical expectation of seeing is believing. Um, yeah, so this image is a still from my most recent work called Scaffolding Preface. Um, it's a coronal cross section um of my head which i designed and then the model was produced in collaboration with another local artist savannah fleming um, and now i will show like a brief excerpt from that video work um and so that you can sort of like understand the some of what was going into my thinking in making this work So I'll just show you the opening um, subtitle sequence. Just briefly show another scene of the work so you can get a feel for the visuals. <laughs> So um, coming back to this still image, like I'll just let the work kind of speak for itself and not describe it too much, but I'll just say briefly, like my interest in this image is sort of like the narrator of that work um, is in the way that um, like with this way of depicting a human form, like it, 
it is a divergence from the sort of like um, more common Western medicine presentation of bodies as like separated out discrete systems like this musculoskeletal system, the respiratory system, like the um, nervous system, the reproductive system and so on. Um, by comparison, this image is like an image of um, the body as it is like these interwoven, interknitted systems that um, like form life together. Um, and it's also like a redaction of the optics of like having a face um, which has become sort of like linchpin for understanding people and humans. So this image for me is kind of like a way to um, evade that and like all of the things that come along with having a face, like most perhaps obviously to me is like um, an increase in sort of like the use of nodal points on, a, on faces for the purposes of surveillance and tracking. Um, so that was some of my thinking in making this work. Um, I won't speak for too much longer because I think that I don't have heaps of time, but um, I will now just like go backwards in time to a work that um, was made in 2017, which is a performance work um, that has been, that was devised in 2017 and then was like, has been restaged a number of times times in different places and the artwork is called Hypnic. Um, so I'll play an excerpt of this documentation of it, which was like um, performance for camera for the purpose of documentation. And I'm not really aesthetic cast of my nose and my mouth um, adhered to my hand. So yeah, here's some documentation of the work as it was performed at um, ACCA in 2018. And here's another photo from the same rendition of the work um of it's like a close-up shot singing to a little baby in a bundle uh, so i guess i'm showing this performance work as sort of like an example of maybe in my practice like a more formative way that i was thinking about um these like experiences of like a fractured sense of selfhood or like um, um, a sense of becoming and being with a self in a state of becoming, which I think is like, yeah, intimately tied to trans experience. Um, so this was the second kind of prompt that Mel gave us to think on, which is like, what is the social function of performance? Um, and I wanted to read this quote from feminist um, theorist, Patricia Clough, 
which is affect is not to be misunderstood as pre-social. It is open-endedly social, that is social in a manner prior to the separating out of individuals. So think about like the medium that I work in is affect. And I think about affect is like the emotional atmosphere that is surrounding us that um, like performance work allows us to sort of feel into um, in a more direct way. Um, and then I maybe like I'll just finish on this, which is a small piece of writing. I often have like many notes, very <laughs> kind of like messily collated everywhere in my life in diaries and on random pieces of paper. And one of the places where I put notes is in the stickies application on my desktop. So this is a small piece of writing um, written at some point this year. No, sorry, last year. 2021, and I'll read it. I am a Frisbee and I float and I have a hidden fun side. Lime green trees tickle the air, move the wind through my body, burping, farting, yawning. Make a wish when you give head. The power, the influence, the traction, the tubing. The end of days feeling. What kind of days exactly? The nine to five, the noble work day, chasing the impossibility of ownership to the damaging effect of dispossession. Nothing here was created without deceit. West is the deceitful direction. These affects are impersonal and deeply social. How to collectively own a feeling. And I thought to finish on that because maybe that's like a question that underpins like the drive that I feel when I'm making performance work is like, how can we collectively feel something together? Um, so I'm gonna finish up there. I hope that wasn't too much um, over time and hand over to Amrita. Um, thank you very much, Archie. I am speaking to you today from the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and I'm speaking to you through multiple cables and uh, the deep sea of the internet that runs through many countries, states, territories and imaginings of borders. <clears throat> um, so my name is Amrita Heppy and I'm an artist and my work deals, well, an artist and a dancer. And um, to summarize myself today, um, my work deals with popular mythology and this idea of the body as an archive. And I'll give a more specific definition of that soon. <clears throat> my work uses a combination of broken samples, strange loops, and most recently AI, to think about how various influences, cultural, economic, psychological, bear down on a person. Uh, my definition of choreography is the organization of space and time. Uh, of recent, I've been more and more interested in this idea of how computers see, <clears throat> but more how they change the way that we see ourselves. And I think that this has been a lingering fascination uh, that took hold as early as um, interactions with video clips in the early 2000s and that served for a lot of initial research at the moment. I like to think about works like mnemonics. Mnemonics being the study and development of systems for improving or maybe not improving, but for kind of inscribing a memory. <clears throat> And that whether it's a video or a performance, the act of doing it, much like games or carving, inscribes a new memory or pathway for doing and being. Um, when I talk about the body as a point of archive within my practice, I think this is one of the things that I mean. I think of it uh, as a deposit. I think of it like there's a lot of sublunary muck to sift through in order to make and usually there is movement within that 
or the witnessing of movement of from others. Um, it's not always <clears throat> that the deposits are clear and go from, as this uh, conversation talks about, from archive to form and content. Rather, I would say something usually prompts me in order to have a reaction. And then there is the figuring out of how to contextualize this within a broader sphere. I wish I could say it was unboundedness, but it is not. I sometimes think of uh, Franz Fanon's question of what do you do with an unconscious that hates you <laughs> as getting to the more interesting material? Well, it is not always hateful. Ex well, it's not always a hateful experience requires quite a bit of sifting. I'm going to share my screen now. <clears throat> um, at the moment, you're seeing um, a part of a glossary of terms that I wrote. And I thought this um, might be a good way to also introduce myself. Um, this was for Unprojects uh, in 2020. And I think a lot of the time when we think about dance, we think about it as this kind of unbound, um, very self-expressive form. And, you know, maybe we're also past that kind of imaginary point that we think about art as this like total um, expression. But um, I guess I wanted to give some definitions of um, uh, for myself that I've written for myself. And so an anti-ante dancer and a dancer who is a dancer who is preoccupied not with the expressive notion of dance, but with the possibilities, communities, kinships and images that emerge from the pursuit of pleasure and rigor through dancing. Another thing that I've discussed a lot within my practice uh, is the kind of dilemma of authenticity. And so I thought to give this glossary of terms um, a different definition of authenticity, which is a dilemma to be inspected in dance as much as in handbags. The anti-dancer moves towards the dilemma of authenticity rather than the possibility of it. Um, I'm now going to talk to my work. Uh, I think that um, the first work that Mel had asked me to speak about within this series, um, or the first one that's work that came up was something called Soothsayer Serenades. And look, Soothsayer Serenades doesn't have as much of a, a visual face because it was a provocation. I made Soothsayer Serenades in 2000 and 2021 and it's still currently touring with the international curators initiative or foundation sorry um, currently it's in turkey and it's just been in calgary and will be in taiwan um, soon and las vegas <laughs> uh, which is interesting to think about because it was very site specific and basically during the pandemic, I was asked to teach a lot of online dance classes and deliver a lot of online content. Um, it's actually funny that I'm doing this now because I um, resisted. In fact, I flat out refused. My thinking behind this was how dare we kind of flatten things into the immediate market driven demand to deliver you something that I find incredibly unsatisfying uh, online dance classes and um, yeah I just I I couldn't do it I was like or oh, you know dance um, you know in, in some ways is already an impaired apparatus in terms of how we are witnessing it why would I make it um, flattened once again and so from that reactivity uh, came Suse Serenades and Suse Serenades was a playlist that was released at 4 p.m. every week and it had a provocation and it was to listen together and it was to not have any online um, presence. There was no Zoom, no Instagram Live, no recording of a, of a work for an institution. Um, you just left the trace of where you wish, where you wished in, 
in the real world. And a uh, soothsayer is a person who can predict the future by magical, intuitive, or even rational means. And this was a provocation uh, for moving, moving togetherness. And I think that's something that I've been interested in is the idea of participation and that participation is always happening whether we think we're participating or not. And I've been really interested in this in terms of uh, using it um, as a tool to make work or how to get people to participate in the works made and considering the dynamics of that. <clears throat> uh, the next work I'm going to talk about is uh, Rinse. And so I'll show you an image from Rinse. Do, do, do. And so this is a work that was originally made, um, it was put in, made in a theatre as part of the Keir Choreographic Award. And <clears throat> Rinse was about, uh, I think it was, well, Rinse was about beginnings. And I'm going to get my notes up here. Um, so Rinse asks, what is it about the beginning that remains intoxicating? The persistent lust for the initial thrill of a romance, scene, canon, theory, relationship, meal, country, the opening lines. So this work explores the romance of beginnings and what happens when the inertia takes over. I felt like in Rinse, I was deliberating with the following material. Will I always be held to the last standard and then asked to be greater than that. <clears throat> Rinse also questioned whether being on the brink of extinction or endings has, it has intensified the seduction of the past, the fraught idolization of the singular narrative under the grip of hegemony. And it did that through creating um, a kind of entropic origin myth on stage. Rinse traveled from end to end positioning personal narratives in relation to dance, art, canons, void, desires, popular culture, colonial history, and taking the idea that power mutates from beginning to beginning. And this work uh, was a solo, and I worked with Mish Grigor on the script, as well as Dando Janach with sound. But I feel like in the past few years, there's been a separation between this idea of what's made in terms of visual arts and what's made in terms of contemporary dance. And then it kind of uh, accumulates within, to the the within the theatre. Um, and a question that I'm asked a lot is, um, you know, how do you go from one to the other when I feel they are so intrinsically linked in terms of my understanding of how I'm making them? Uh, Mel also was asking us to talk a bit about, I guess, identity and the end of identity and like also this idea of what um, the social function of spaces or performance uh, uh, dictates. I think that I'm always aware of the space that I'm going into. For example, I knew that this was going to be in a theatre. A theatre has a social function of you walk in, you sit down, and you watch, which is different to the kind of uh, passivity that is sometimes allowed within a gallery or even the interaction. <clears throat> uh, uh, in Rinse, I'm constantly asking this question about beginnings, you know, and constantly telling the audience about beginnings. In the beginning, there is nothingness, not to be confused with emptiness. In the beginning, there is, and it'll go through different personal narratives, and it's almost as if these things from the repetition of this line in the beginning builds and builds and builds and builds and has an image and an architecture one on top of the other. <clears throat> I like to think about this idea that um, that language can be used in performance to describe not only a mess on scene, but to tell you also what's not there. <clears throat> Uh, to describe an absence as well. The uh, next work I'm going to talk about is um, a work that 
again was made within the pandemic but something that I've been thinking of for a while it's called The Kiss it was made in 2020 and I'll show you an excerpt of it first and then we'll talk to it I often imagine myself in the fantasy of revenge. Not the hero, but cutting through things with my body, with ease. This may be as tragic as it is motivating. How to take back pride, love, a country. Having the freedom to act in the moment with purpose and evil intentions. It can seem the really hard things make people suffer less than the small things. Maybe because for the hard and big things, there's somewhat an expectation or method. But the small things, what someone says to you, the prolonged grief, if that's small, happens in solitary. I do hate the idea of trying to scale suffering. With this in mind, I've been wondering, how do you take revenge on a virus? Would you show me how to dance good, kiss well? An arts administrator once told me that rhetorical questions made your artistic statements sound lacking. I have many. Is there ever really enough time to grieve? What is it that you really want? Where'd you go? Did you know that humans made drones by copying birds? And I learned how to kiss by copying mouths in motion. Um, the kiss for me was um, part of this idea of revenge. You know, how do you take revenge in a virus? But more importantly, is the notion of revenge even actually possible? Um, and I think it discusses this idea that comes up a lot for me in my thinking that, you know, a lot of the times um, I think when identity is put on the line, it's discussed as if it's this dual thing, you're one and the other, when really um, both ends of this binary are two black and white and actually what forms what I think a kind of concentra concentrated aperture of focus is usually... <clears throat> a form of hybridity. And just to end, um, I'd like to refer back to the glossary of movement um, from Unprojects, which is that hybridity as an adjective is a cornerstone of possibility. Uh, and I will wrap up there and yeah, look forward to talking to Archie and Melissa. Thank you both for those really interesting, um, beautiful presentations. I love that you ended on hybridity and possibility and reader. I think that really um, vibed with some of what Archie, you were saying too about multiplicity of self and some of the experiments you've been doing around self-portraiture. I think probably it shows up very clearly in what you showed us with Hypnic performance works that began in 2017 and kind of went onwards. Um, and Rita, um, hybridity also might, I guess, play out in your notion of the body as an archive as well, um, which I've found a really one of the most fascinating things about dance and this idea against the neutral body that we're all really carriers of so many influences, um, which was really uh, present in how you spoke, Archie, and shared with us some of those quotes from influences. But, uh, and I think you really uh, divulged or shared that that is a little bit about how you think of the self as well as sort of made up of these different influences. 
on that kind of thought conceptual level as well as maybe the micro <laughs> if we think about how the human body is um, less than 50 percent human cells um, we start to really get into this freaky territory that some of us love and maybe some of us hate particularly thrown up I guess by the virus um, which is another interesting end there to talk about um, so there's not really a question in that uh, but I guess sort of provocations around hybridity is somehow become like what I see as as the coalescing point of what you've both said today so yeah thank you for that observation as well um, hybridity is that been something that you've also looked at a lot and read it with the current work rinse or the recent work I was lucky enough to see it in Sydney for the Kier choreographic award that first showing I think one of the showings and I found it really fascinating like a bit tongue-in-cheek as well about what is what is the self and, and how, how do we always have to have these narratives mm. I think um like similarly to Archie this idea of um yeah questioning where that selfhood starts and and tying in all of the influences and it came from a frustration of um of this idea of like, looking at anthems in other works like how how I felt a bit wrapped in knots about how it was that I could explain anything through the body and so I sought to complicate it all out and to be like this is the beginning and this is the beginning and this is the beginning and obviously as soon as, as soon as that accumulated on stage it was almost like just from saying the words of what I think was there and letting you into this idea of the personal uh, these these personal narratives some of them were not my own I was talking about the origin story of the earth maybe actually that is my own origin story um, um, and some of them I'd kind of stolen from other places uh, but was telling them as if they were my own and the kind of um, that idea of the authentication of the earth and um, you know is is how we choose to make meaning then our own um yeah and I think like you know, rinse is now being developed into a longer work within the theater and I am um, yeah I sometimes I feel like almost this idea of hybridity wraps it into a neat bow maybe too much mm -hmm. um you know and it kinds of kind of puts it at the end point rather than showing all the bits and pieces that um a hybrid uh, truly has what do you think, Archie? Yeah, I feel like the word hybrid is like one of these, maybe is like becoming or is already like one of these words we use in art, like the way that people use the phrase the body, like who mm. is the body? Do I live in the body? Like <laughs> body is the body, which is like, well, we all know it's just the dominant body. It's like the healthy body or like mm. quote unquote healthy body. Mm. But anyway, I feel like hybridity is maybe like becoming one of these words, which is like standing in for something in a way where it's like, well, that word can't actually hold like the full measure of what it means to be composite or to be complicated or to be like many things at once. Mm. Um, mm -mm. That's what I was thinking when you were saying that just then, you know? Yeah, yeah, totally. And then, it, I mean, I think about this with the semantics of, of words changing in our relation to them. And it's and it's good, I think, to talk about this. You know, it's even like for me, I think about the, the changing idea of, yes, the body, because um, then I hear architects talk about the choreography of the body when they're creating works or even in dance where it's like, um, you know, just give me a neutral body. And I was like, the... And then the other word I find um, complicated is, is community. And it's, I guess it's always like changing and, um, but yeah, I'm like, what is the community that you are speaking for? And even in the pursuit of that question of asking, you know, like who, 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 which is within my hysterical nature and neurotic nature to do so, um, and looking for the definition of it, um, I think it changes. You know, because they are like 
it's people who are have different interests and you know you don't want to assume it's almost like it assumes the kind of um yeah it assumes too much of who people are um mm. yeah. yeah yeah I think it like in my mind it sort of like assumes a kind of sameness or like mm. I think about and I feel like maybe this is like some tie into your work and your thinking lately about like um like um AI and like mm. these modalities through which are like <laughs> facets of personhood are sort of like expressed or exchanged in like this like ways that are really different to like how I feel right now like with the weight of my body and the temperature of my skin and everything but um um yeah like this word community I think is like suggesting like well you have a community of people who like think the same or act the same um and I feel like that's like a really exemplar of like the way that we've opted into like this algorithmic way of understanding each other as like yes. having something in common and that being the most important thing. Like I was thinking about um, in the last two years, like the really trying and difficult circumstances have produced like new relationships with people who are not like me. And that's how, that's like how I grow and like that that every like it comes back to what I was saying at the start of my little presentation was like mm -hmm. um a person isn't one thing like <laughs> across time um mm -hmm. and like I think like that's the thing like the way that I experience that narrative is like because I'm trans people might look at me and see like an accelerated form of change that they mm -hmm. can go like oh trans people or people who are gender diverse like um stand in for like self-determination mm. or something or like the will to change or something like yeah. that but like everybody transitions from like child to like into maturities of different kinds and like um I think we actually like desperately need to be with people who are, are like not like us actually yeah oh, totally this idea of like also the idea of I was thinking about you now I was talking to somebody who was dual the other day and this idea of being having somebody to be around in the transitory states of 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 becoming becoming like being around when birth is happening, but also like being around when death is happening and like also then being around in the kind of transitioning of people's like, yeah, yeah. And I love this idea that you're talking about it in terms of an accelerated state. I sometimes think about this idea of, I mean, um, this idea about around First Nations people and especially in the last, maybe like the last, like, I don't know, five years, uh, I have been thinking about this idea of like embodied knowledge and, and knowing things that other people don't and who gets to have the knowledge and this accelerated um, almost responsibility that I find with a lot of young First Nations people that they bear the, the weight of this and that we're always kind of um, that, that, you know, when it's allowed to be shared and when it's not. And I think that it poses this problem of like, you know, between these kinds of binaries of like, you know, black excellence, you know, and, and then also like, you know, pity or damnation, you know, incarceration. And if you're able to talk about it, then, you know, and there is no space to the intermediary kind of mediocrity that inevitably mm -hmm. is a part of it. Like, I'm like, what about black mediocrity? I probably get shocked for saying this, but, you know, <laughs> and I think like, I think a lot about like this resistance within art making or the question of, you know, what we might want when we're not under surveillance, you know, and, and, and the, the, this exploration cannot be about policing people or attempting to satisfy their desires. You know, it reminded me of like an art teacher saying, you know, if you're making work that your mother will like the ultimate other, then you're in trouble. And, you know, cause even if you're, you're trying to make work that please others, you'd be presuming what they like. And the presumption comes with its own set of kind of ethical horns 
of going, you know, I, I'm going to make a work that that people will like because they understand that I am I am X, Y, or Z. And, um, yeah, I kind of would like to resist or reject the pressure to write for that, this idea of the betterment of a society or, you know, mm. because I don't believe that art is media and it's yeah it's not it's not necessarily fodder it's like a true vulnerability um mm -hmm. and it's not to make neat generalizations about culture when you're dealing with it unfurling as it were all the time um and so i'd like it to be in a kind of like amoral universe potentially or yeah yeah <laughs> There's so, so much in that. Um, do you think about an audience when you're making? Yes, of course. <laughs> I mean, I'm not like totally inconsiderate. I just, um, <laughs> I'm, I'm super considerate. I think about how I'd like them to participate. I think about where, the, where I'd like them to sit and if I'd like them to sing and how they'll be in relation to me and what that closeness and intimacy is and, completely think about it but I do I I also think about you know maybe it's what Archie was talking about in terms of affect you know in terms of the affect that is created between me and the audience and I mean maybe it's deluded of me to think that I could try to like control it maybe the better word is influence the affect that permeates within the room but yes definitely think about the audience how to collectively own a feeling, you said, Archie, which mm. I think is a, a bit about where that was leading as well. Yeah, and I think, like, for me, that comes into, like, um, thinking about education and, like, the way that as we are raised in, like, this part of the world, um, we're not, like, we're taught that we are supposed to try and say what we think but we're not really taught how to try and emote or to, to say what we feel, let alone to act how we feel. And like, mm. perhaps artwork is like one of these last places in culture where um, there is permission granted to attempt acting how we feel and to attempt witnessing that, which I think like, I have tingles right now because like, it's been so like maybe because it's been a while since I've been able to access that or like be in that with other people or see other people in like that state of performance which I think is like really generous but also like a deep responsibility and and with that word I mean like this like to have the capacity to respond like the ability to respond like in time with other people there um so anyway, I'm diverging from like <laughs> what you raised about, um, yeah, to how to collectively own a feeling. Um, I, yeah, I love, but I, I love that, that like mm. this idea of like um, how, you know, we're, we're taught to describe how we feel versus like try to channel it in any other way. Like I remember, um, and I usually avoid making these kinds of anecdotes, but as a child, I was like, if I can just use my body, I will mm. not have to talk. And the only time that I, I came into this idea of talking was after get, becoming incredibly ill. And they were like, you need, if you don't describe what's happening right now, you're going to die. Mm. And at 11, and I was like, okay. And then after that, I was like, blah, 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 blah. everyone needs <laughs> to know what I'm thinking as well as this communication with the body. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, I was like, I now think about this experience and I'm like, how, how can I, how, how could I think that? And also was it successful as a young person? <laughs> do you mean successful? What do you mean by that? In terms of the, in terms of communicating with my body, in terms of thinking about learning how to do that with the mechanisms of dance and also with other mechanisms of like sport and the physicality of, 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 of communicating that way. Because yeah. I was like, I just didn't want to have to, I, thought, I saw that language uh, really complicated things. 
<clears throat> language is complicated <laughs> um Archie you've been singing more and more and I think it's well I guess that's always been there but I think with both of you it's always so really interesting about what's not said and that how you both draw on other senses it's not necessarily the primacy of the visual or explaining and describing it's also creating these atmospheres of, of feeling and connection um, in the process I'm thinking Amrita of those uh, choreographed dances that you made in collaboration with different people you would invite oh, them into the dance. their own dances yeah that was yeah. very beautiful um, yeah but that was also the, that was that was like a great um a great exercise in opacity that you could only be you could only understand something when you can understand beyond the point of difference so the anecdote for that is that I would say it would be in Germany giving this talk and they'd be like, talk to me about Hanover. And they'd be like, you know, Hanover's Hanover. What do, I, what do I have to say? And I'm like, have you lived anywhere else? And they're like, oh, I lived in Berlin. And then I'm like, okay, tell me about Hanover as compared to Berlin. They're like, oh, well, you know, okay, it's like this, people in Berlin, they're not, you know, and, and it was only in the kind of point of difference that there became this kind of... Um, the ability to really clearly see it's like on the boundary point of not being something you can describe, you could begin to describe what it was. And I was like, oh, it's such a clear um, uh, articulation of something that I thought that I understood and that I understood better by sitting with hundreds of people and asking them these questions of definition and in order to put it into a dance. And the mundanity of it as well, you know, the mundanity of like, these dances where it's like I want I want people to know about the football team and so it's like this I I, I need people to see that um, that the theater and what I did in the theater actually was part of the history of these things and and yeah I, I liked that exercise <laughs> I just want to ask if there's any other reflections you wanted to close this talk with as we hit the time we discussed we would end on. Oh, I'd like to hang out with Archie um, off, not online. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's my reflection. <laughs> yeah, did <ditto. laughs> okay. it? Great. That's I think we've We've really uh, communicated the theme of this semester of Formed by Content on Connection. And I want to thank you both for your really interesting, insightful presentations in this conversation that I wish could be a bit longer. So thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your days. And thank you to all the people watching and listening for their time as well. <laughs>